Awesome, thank you, Bill. And thank you everyone for joining us. So uh, I'm excited to talk to you all a little bit about uh, how I think we can just go beyond uh, building awareness with our invasive species work and really try to move towards uh, behavior change that can help us with invasive species prevention. So I'll spend maybe uh, five to seven minutes on this, uh, just providing you kind of with my outlook uh, on this topic and then go right into uh, some of the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers work that we do in Wisconsin. And so I think it's helpful for me to tell you a little bit about my background first and kind of how I ended up uh, where I am today as you know an outreach specialist really uh, you know, thinking a lot about behavior change and how we can apply these behavior change principles to invasive species prevention. And I think probably like a lot of people on the phone or on the webinar today, uh, my schooling and background was really more rooted in you know, the physical and natural sciences uh, between you know experiences in high school, uh, undergrad, undergrad and graduate school. I was outside a lot um, doing you know, field ecology, uh, summer internships that were based you know, in field work and science and then uh, my master's project was sampling tributaries of the Great Lakes for the Round Gobi. So it was really being out in the field. And I really just thought that this understanding of the natural world and you know, invasive species was really going to be um, how I thought I could see or how I could make a really big impact on the environment and bring about those positive changes. Um, and so my first job out of college is actually this job, which is really, really cool <laughs> that I've uh, been able to be here for so long already. And you know, one of my first tasks was to go to trade shows and uh, just talk with boaters and anglers and let them know about the importance of aquatic invasive species prevention. And I really took the aquatic invasive species part of my job uh, very seriously when I started. I still do, but I really thought that understanding, you know, everything about aquatic invasive species, uh, every you know, little fact about them, and if I could relay those to our boaters and anglers, I'd get people really interested in the topic. I could and to relay my passion for the environment and the topic. And you know, I thought if I could give people all the uh, knowledge and awareness, then when they went out onto the landscape and were boating and fishing, you know, they would stop aquatic hitchhikers because they were aware. They would remember our conversation from the sports show and they'd pick all the plants off their boat, they'd drain the water, they'd dry their boat as long as they can. And yeah, you know, kind of just thought that that was really how it worked when I started. Unfortunately, uh, I had to learn that by experience, <laughs> that it's not really how it works. I wish I would have read all the behavior change literature when I started <laughs> that, that supported that idea. Uh, you know, to really kind of uh, ground myself in this idea that you know, knowledge is necessary, but usually insufficient for the behavior change that we want to see on the landscape. I think a lot of kind of initially when we're starting these um, you know, these efforts to see some sort of environmental change, you know awareness is the goal or education's the goal. And while that's necessary, I would argue that with a lot of invasive species work, people are already you know, aware of the issue or the topic. And that's not the limiting factor right now. What we're really after are positive environmental changes. Uh, we wanna see you know, less people moving invasive species around. We wanna see you know, less lakes invaded, less new invasive species. And awareness itself just doesn't get you there. Um, I think there's a, a really good article that I enjoy, uh, Stop Raising Awareness Already, uh, that's in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. It came out about three years ago. And I think it covers a, a few different examples of you know, this point. My favorite, that's a good reason to read the, the article by itself. Uh, there's a few paragraphs discussing uh, an awareness campaign uh, done by FEMA to promote emergency preparedness. And they relate emergency preparedness to the, to the zombie apocalypse. And, they say that if you're prepared for the zombie apocalypse, that you should be prepared for any other disaster. And by really all of the marketing metrics, this campaign was a huge success. Uh, you know, shortly after, you know, within the first day of uh, the first article being posted, I think FEMA's website crashed because it was so popular and people were reading it. Unfortunately though, while it raised awareness of the need to be prepared for disasters, people didn't create disaster plans for their households. They didn't create disaster preparedness kits. Um, um, they followed up with that when they realized that people weren't doing what they wanted. And you know, a campaign more rooted in you know, community-based social marketing and helping you know, create situations where it was easy to create that kit actually did a better job at getting people prepared for disasters than preparing for the zombie apocalypse. So 
I think you know, maybe another example I can kind of bring a little bit closer to home that maybe we're all experiencing um, is just that three o'clock trip to the kitchen to grab a snack. And so I wish this were my kitchen for a number of different reasons. Uh, first thing I notice is that it's really clean, which I'm really jealous of. Um, but I'm sure every afternoon people uh, stumble upstairs from their from their dungeon office to go look for a snack and you start rooting through the cupboards you probably know you should eat something healthy you should have a piece of fruit or some vegetables um, but as you start looking through the the cabinets you notice the chocolate bars you notice the the potato chips and you decide you know what today i'm gonna have those instead and then that ends up being every single day even though you know that you should probably pick something healthier for a snack but we could create you know a a situation where it's a little bit easier for us to make a good decision, you know, by doing something like putting a fruit bowl out on the counter. Uh, research shows that you know, if you have a fruit bowl out on the counter, you're just more likely to have a piece of fruit because it's there, it's easy, you don't have to think about it. You've created a situation to make a better decision. You know, it's kind of similar to people that just don't buy cookies or chips and keep those in the house because you're creating a situation where those things aren't an option. So, you know, I think these are just really easy examples that we probably all have some experience with in terms of helping change our own behaviors that we deal with every day. And I think that um, we can apply that to our invasive species work, you know, through community-based social marketing. And a lot of these things just try to create situations where the ideal behavior is easier for people to take, or it's you know, the easiest thing for people to take. So it could be by you know, producing signage that reminds people to take action, provides tools. It could just be little reminders like these, uh, duck bands that waterfowl hunters collect. Um, it could be towels that people use when they're on the boat or even use to wipe off their boat. You know, all of these things um, can help remind people and make uh, a situation where that ideal behavior is easy. And things like stop aquatic cave trikers, play clean go, don't move fire word. Um, these aren't like the so community-based social, social marketing tools themselves, but I would say that these consistent brands and messages cut across all of these efforts and make these efforts more effective. When we have this consistent message and brand that we can use across all these tools, it can only help us. And there are plenty of different invasive species, uh, you know, behavior change awareness campaigns that you can choose from. And we're just focusing on three today. If you use a different one than we have today, um, that's fine. Co-branding is great. And we're always here to kind of help you work through uh, some of your messaging to make sure you're being as effective as possible. So at that, I'm going to jump into a little bit of uh, you know, Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, the background and how we use it in Wisconsin. So uh, some really kind of high level background of Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers. Uh, the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign has actually been around a while, 18 years. Um, it's a national education campaign that was launched by the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force in 2002. And if you go to the website, stopaquatichitchhikers.org, so, uh, there's some information on there, but if you look to the uh, the take action part of the website, there's the general clean, drain, dry guidance that applies to everything. And you know, if you can just remember that, you should be uh, well on your way to preventing the spread of invasive species. But what I do like about the website is that for each different recreational water user, there might be some additional, more specific information that applies only to, only to that pathway that the website provides a little bit more information on. So. You know, for example, for motorboats or you know, uh, personal watercraft, you know, it can uh, provide a little bit more information on you know, how to uh, empty out any excess water from the internal drive or you know, information about pulling the drain plug or emptying out the live well, things that might only apply to motorboats versus other kind of recreational activities. And so uh, these were all created as part of the recreational guidelines. Uh, by the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force that I think were uh, most recently updated in 2014. And so I think this is really useful for stop aquatic hitchhikers because it's not just the general guidance that is good across most or if not all recreational activities that happen on the water. You can get some more specific information for each pathway. And something that I really value about stop aquatic hitchhikers is the aquatic nuisance species uh, leadership for uh, stop aquatic hitchhikers. So the task force was established by uh, an act of Congress in 1990. The membership includes 12 federal agencies and 12 ex officio members. It's co-chaired by the Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA, and then also the regional uh, ANS panels that people might be uh, aware of or involved with 
while they're not technically members, they serve as a you know an important advisory role and almost the working arm of the task force. And I think pretty much any organization, uh, a state agency, an NGO, federal agency, all has the ability to be involved either in the regional panels or the task force. And I think that when you combine all of these um, and into the task force, that you know, the task force having a backing of stop aquatic hitchhikers really brings a lot of resources available to stop aquatic hitchhikers uh, to promote that across the country, which I think is really powerful uh, for the use of the brand. And so if we look at just the national adoption of stop aquatic hitchhikers, uh, recently I had a student look through the websites of a bunch of different federal agencies uh, just to see, or just to try to, uh, understand a little bit more about who's using what in terms of uh, aquatic invasive species prevention branding. And 40 out of 50 states at least referenced stop aquatic hitchhikers on their website. And then most of the other states that didn't mention stop aquatic hitchhikers, uh, they had AIS branding and information there. They used, maybe used different branding. But what I thought was really great is even if they used a different brand, it was all similar messaging. And so I think that really shows how successful this initial Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers effort has been in creating consistent messaging across the country. Um, there's you know, more than a thousand partners state or nationwide. Um, I know the number is higher than thousands, but I couldn't find the exact number. And uh, I know it's more than a thousand, so a thousand plus partners. But we have a lot of partners across the country. You can see those on the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers website. And you know, even without signing up to be a partner, you can get on the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers website right now and just download the brand, brand materials that you can use uh, to create your own invasive species prevention tools. But by signing up as a partner, uh, you also can you know, get access to other brand tools. There's a library of example products on the website. So that way you can just get some inspiration from what other people have done. Uh, whether it's you know billboard signage pamphlets a lot of that stuff's there and we're working on a stop aquatic hitchhikers portal that you can actually upload uh, the design files of the documents so that way if you know you want to you know, use an existing card you can get that pdf tweak it a little bit and uh, you know, send it away for production without having to design something completely new in terms of evaluation i'm not going to talk too much about evaluation because uh, the real Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers uh, evaluation expert, expert would be Doug Jensen from Minnesota Sea Grant. So I'm just gonna summarize some of his work really briefly, but I know this is something that he's been working on a lot uh, the past you know, 15 years or so in terms of understanding how Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers works. And in, just in general, um, there seems to be an improvement in intention to take action before and after brand exposure. So people see that brand um, and relative to before they saw it, uh, they believe that they're more likely to take action to uh, prevent the spread of invasive species. A 2007 survey of a three-state area found that 97% uh, of the respondents were influenced a large to a moderate amount to take action to prevent the spread of invasive species based off the brand. And then other research has shown that nine out of 10 boaters that have never been, uh, never seen stop aquatic kid checkers before understand what the, the brand means upon first time the first time that they've seen it. So all, I think all of those things combined just show that how effective stop aquatic hitchhikers can be, um, and that you know, it's really you know, proven to be uh, a useful prevention brand. So how, I guess how we use stop aquatic hitchhikers in Wisconsin, I w first wanna just briefly talk about kind of a program management level um, between myself and uh, Jeannie Shear, the other AIS outreach specialist for Wisconsin. You know, at a statewide level, as the outreach specialist, we work with our communication staff uh, to develop content if we need to produce a, a new pamphlet or a card for uh, you know, any, any water user. So let's just say you know, anglers that uh, will develop content with our communication staff to make sure that um, you know, it's good, tight content uh, and accurate. And then we'll work with a graphic designer to help us develop you know, professional looking and feeling products. Uh, I think both of us feel that that's a really important part of the process. Um, I personally don't really feel very satisfied when I've spent a ton of time on a document uh, to create something that looks like uh, I maybe could have created the same thing when I was in high school. And so I found it really useful to uh, work with graphic designers to make sure that we have those professional looking products because they just look and feel much better. And then when we hand those off to the stakeholders, it just it's easier for them to digest the information when it's in that nice format. So I really encourage people to go that route if possible. 
then at the local level, I think uh, our local AIS partners in Wisconsin, where there's you know about 50 people working at a more local level on AIS prevention in Wisconsin, um, because we're able to quickly and easily put together stop going to hitchhikers materials, uh, they can spend more time reaching people versus trying to create similar documents uh, that may already exist. You know, they can take the documents we produce and reach out to people. And because we have this process where we know the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, our brand and our message, it's easy for people to suggest and receive new content because we're all on board with the same message and brand. Uh, so we already are you know, 50 plus percent of the way there in creating something when we know we need it. And you know, I think across both levels, uh, we really appreciate using message that's consistent with other states and that we know that works. So we know that if we get out of state people or if people traveling, they're gonna see the same message someplace else. And we appreciate the evaluation work that's been done on it uh, to know that it has an impact. So here's just a few examples of some things that we've put together. Uh, we really like these kind of pathway specific cards that are just front and back. The front uh, really just tries to connect with the pathway user, you know, shows, um, an example of somebody using that pathway. So here's our scuba card. And then if, you know, it has a very strong Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers brand. And then on the back, this is our uh, waiting angler card, really geared towards trout anglers. Um, we try to have you know, a graphic and a checklist to let people know what they should be looking at to clean. And then uh, a lot of text. <laughs> but uh, we also like to try to do a short risk assessment with people so that way we we really always encourage people to do the clean drain dry, but if people might be higher risk, we can encourage some other steps too. Uh, we also have all of our trade show materials. So um, I wish I could take credit for these, but these were mostly created as part of a Great Lakes Sea Grant Network, uh, GLRI project. So all of these materials are consistent across the basin, which is great. So we have our trade show banners, you know, hats, koozies, keychains, and a whole bunch of other prompts that um, you know, we have production files for if people are interested in. So if you're now super excited about Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, I think the best thing for you to do would be to contact your state aquatic invasive species coordinator, your state AIS outreach coordinator, or, or a local sea grant or extension agent. Uh, any one of those people would be able to uh, get you in touch with the right person and probably be able to provide you with some information on you know, how their state is using Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers and how you can tie into that message. And if you are a state agency person and would just like to talk more about Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, I am sure that, or I'd be very happy uh, to talk to you more about that. So at that, uh, my contact information is on this slide. I'm happy to, uh, again, talk to anyone about Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers. And I am now going to uh, pass things off to Lean, Lee Greenwood with the uh, Nature Conservancy. Hi everyone, let me just do my best to get my webcam on, okay. And we're gonna do full screen on the PowerPoint. And that should do it. All right, so thanks very much for the introduction, Tim. Um, we're going to pivot from aquatic to terrestrial, but there are so many similarities between the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign and Don't Move Firewood that it is kind of crazy. So just keep in mind that these are remarkably similar efforts, just in completely different environmental realms. So Don't Move Firewood has been around since 2008, and its creation was largely influenced by the presence of Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers before it as a nationwide behavior change based campaign to prevent the movement of invasive species. So firewood is a major uh, human assisted spread vector for invasive forest pests because trees uh, are the <laughs> attack point for forest pests as well as there can be many hitchhiking pests that may or may not attack trees directly that occur on firewood. So when we look at the Don't Move Firewood campaign, we I like to start off for anybody who's new to it by showing the guiding principles. So our overarching goal is not to eliminate the use of firewood in the slightest. The goal is to protect trees. And the tactic is to slow the spread of invasive forest pests themselves via the vector of firewood. And that's a really important element because sometimes people get confused and they say, "What you know? Why are you trying to destroy 
our camping outing? And the answer is absolutely that's not the case. We are trying to get you to not move firewood. And then instead, we present the three positive behaviors that can replace the behavior of bringing firewood from home or toting at long distances. So those three positive behaviors are our target messages for the firewood users. And those are, you can either buy firewood near where you'll burn it, you can gather firewood on site when that's permitted, or in areas where it's available, you can buy certified heat treated firewood. And so because there are three acceptable positive behaviors that are used in different proportions across the nation, we don't call the Don't Move Firewood campaign the Buy It Where You Burn It campaign or the Buy Certified Heat Treated Firewood campaign. We call it the Don't Move Firewood campaign. However, when you look at the different presentations of the Don't Move Firewood campaign, they are highly flexible. So sometimes we have outreach materials that heavily show the buy it where you burn it slogan because that is the behavior that people are trying to push. Now, Don't Move Firewood itself is owned and run by the Nature Conservancy. So I'm an employee of the Nature Conservancy, but we work in partnership with state, federal, private, university, nonprofit, um, all sorts of different industry entities in order to promote our message. And they can choose um, how they present our message along with us. So we actually work cooperatively to make sure that things look and feel the way that our partners want them to look and feel. So in these examples, you can see that the, on the top right, we have, um, that was a billboard that we used in cooperation with the state of Massachusetts, which has a, um, eradication effort for the Asian longhorn beetle, which is the insect shown uh, on that top billboard shaped piece. Um, and then in the sort of center of the slide, that is a um, boat check station educational banner that goes out next to the state of Montana's um, highway boat check stations so that when people are getting out of their vehicle in order to let the boat inspectors look for aquatic, aquatic hitchhikers, they can see some educational material in case they were moving firewood or thought about moving firewood or uh, whatever. And oops, I don't know. Sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to mess with something and I can't tell if it messed with you guys as well. And then on the bottom right hand side, there is a picture of our national generic brochure, which is what we customize for different states and partners in order to get the message out. So you can see that we talk a lot about the behaviors we want to see alongside the core message of not moving firewood. Now on the bottom left uh, of this slide, you also see that there's a slightly different slogan, buy local, burn local, um, that then says don't move firewood across the bottom. That is the Canadian adaptation of our campaign managed by the Canadian Council on Invasive Species. So they have chosen to take a very slightly different tack, but you'll notice that it's highly compatible branding and highly compatible wording. And so um, the net effect of having these different um, presentations of a single message is that it is a cohesive campaign that really helps the public understand one concept, even if we do have a couple different positive behaviors that we're encouraging. Uh, I have a weird problem where I can only see like half my uh, screen, but I'm assuming everyone else can see it just fine. Otherwise somebody would have told me by now. So we're just going to keep going. Uh, okay, great. So as long as it's just me, it's fine. So the Don't Move Firewood campaign itself, like I said, is run by the Nature Conservancy, and we have a whole bunch of different pieces to our outreach portfolio. So we have a large and pretty successful Facebook account. Right now we have 17,000 followers, um, and we cover a lot of ground on invasive species. We spice it up with things like murder hornets, every once in a while because just talking about firewood endlessly does become a little bit repetitive. So we dabble in other invasive species issues in order to keep the content fresh. We publish e easily three times a week, if not more. This account is great if you manage your own Facebook account for your own employer or volunteer work and you need to think of a new idea, come to ours, take an idea, share a post, whatever it takes. Um, so that we can all be more successful in our social media outreach. So that's a 
great thing that we manage. We have a constantly changing continent wide array of um, partnership billboards, magazine ads, newspaper ads, handouts, posters, online advertisements, you name it. Many of our partner efforts are paid for by the partner and location on the ground. So for instance, perhaps, you know, the let's just make one up. The Oregon Department of Agriculture would like to put up a billboard. Let's pretend. Um, we design the billboard in consultation with them so that it's in our branding and in our look and with wording that we know resonates with the public, and then they pay to place the billboard. So that's the model that we typically use, although sometimes we do have our own advertising dollars and then we make those decisions separately. We also have an email newsletter. If you go on to don'tmovefirewood.org, you will easily find it in one of the little call out boxes. It says join our newsletter. Um, and we have well over a thousand different subscribers and we do a monthly newsletter with issues of uh, forest pests and pathogens. Um, again, much like our Facebook account, we do talk about firewood, but we dabble in other um, topics as well in order to keep it fresh. Um, we have reduced our amount of activity on Twitter, just so everybody knows. We just we don't pay much attention to it because we did not find that it was a successful long term strategy for partnerships or for reaching the public. And those are the two things that we focus on, as I mentioned in that second slide in terms of our target stakeholder groups, um, which is professionals like everybody on this slide. Uh, on this webinar, as well as the public. So if we're not reaching professionals in the field or the public, it's not really worth our time to engage on that particular um, channel of outreach. And then the other thing that I wanted to focus on that came up when we were preparing this webinar is that the majority of our outreach successes come not from direct work of our campaign um, and things that we do you know, on the ground by ourselves, they almost all come from partnerships. We have state partners in, I believe every single state, um, many Canadian provinces participate in our program. Uh, we work with all the federal agencies. Um, you know, if you make a campground reservation, once making campground reservations is allowed again, um, on recreation.gov or reserveamerica.com, in your email confirmation, even though those are federal and private entities, you will receive a notice that says you should learn more about um, buying local firewood to prevent the movement of invasive species to your campground. So we have all of these little behavioral nudges um, through our partnership efforts all over the outreach landscape to make sure that people are receiving the message not to move firewood, to make one of these positive choices that we outlined for people um instead and so that they can take the actions and you know just like tim detailed it's it's so important for people to know what to do especially when you're telling them what not to do you have to that's a it's a yin and a yang right so if you're telling them not to move firewood you have to say don't worry it'll be available at the campground or you have to say you know just plan to gather it if that's you know allowable or whatever it is that enables that behavior to actually be fulfilled by the person who's learning the message. When space is allowing it, we also try to include educational imagery. We found through doing public polling that people very consistently say, I would understand the firewood issue better if I could see the bugs. And so sometimes when we have enough space, we show them the bugs. So this is a full page advertisement that we are doing this summer in some magazines. And the top is our pretty classic approach, which is saying, you know, you have the power to protect forests by firewood where you're burned. And then you have three positive behaviors with those little triangle points by locally harvested firewood, by certified or gather firewood. And then we have this thing that, you know, the people have said they want to see the bugs, they want to see the damage, they want to see the holes. So this grabs the viewer into the picture. So put together it we believe when their space allows this is the most educational successful um format because the messages themselves are pretty simple you know i only need three 10 or less word bullets to outline those but then reinforcing like oh man i don't want all these creepy collie bugs um at my campground is really important so 
In order to put these advertisements out, we have all sorts of different partnerships, like I mentioned, and state-based campaigns. And I did want to highlight that this particularly awesome imagery came from the ideas that our partners in Missouri came up with. So they're the ones who came up with a super successful, um, terrible looking insect infested log imagery that we've been using quite a bit in 2020. Um, so the other thing that we have that we're not using a lot much right now is uh, insect costumes. So our partners can always um, borrow costumes if they would like to once we're back to doing outreach events in public. Um, and that is actually me and the state plant health director of the state of Montana. So now you know what I look like, not just from the video feed, but also from my high level of enthusiasm um, in an insect costume. And I wanted to just take a split second to thank everybody, especially at USDA APHIS. They've been our primary funding agency for a long time. And now I see that a ghost is transforming the webinar to the next PowerPoint um, presenter. So let me hand off to Krista who, and Belle, who are going to present about Play Clean Go. Awesome. Thanks, Lee. Uh, so, hey, everybody. And uh, so I'm Belle Bergner, Executive Director of NASMA, in case you popped in uh, after our webinar started. Um, Chris Stolutsky, our Play Clean Go program manager, is here with me today to talk about the Play Clean Go campaign. Um, so uh, I am just so happy to have us all together here to show you all, uh, one, how similar, as Lee said, the, the sort of the strategy and the, the sort of science behind these uh, campaigns are, uh, there are so many similarities, and also how, how they operate. So all of these campaigns are designed for you to have um, easy access to and customize to your local needs. And I love that Lee said that some of the most successful products have come from partners or in, have been developed in partnership with partners. Um, the other take home message I wanna make sure you all, I hope you all take away from this webinar is that there is no need to recreate the wheel. Um, by the end of uh, our, our portion of this webinar today, talking about Play Clean Go, I hope that you all feel confident that the resources are out there on the web through the websites, that you, the URLs that you've seen today um, to go to and grab the outreach tools that you need for your local areas. So I'm going to get started and uh, just to talk a little bit about the history of Play Clean Go and then Krista is going to get into the details of how you all can get access to the resources um, and outreach tools for your local area. Um, you know, similarly to, as I said, Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers and Don't Move Firewood, Play Clean Go is an out education and outreach campaign, uh, but it is designed for um, all outdoor recreationists. Uh, it was actually originally designed for a as a terrestrial invasive species prevention outreach campaign. Um, and uh, in fact, it was designed by the same brand specialist, if that's the right term, uh, as Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers. So if you feel like there's just a similar vibe between the two, you're absolutely right. I mean, they were actually designed by the same person. Um, and so all these campaigns are, are promoting awareness, understanding, cooperation. Uh, and what we're seeing now through our partners is that they're using Play Clean Go, not just for terrestrial application, but any kind of recreation access point. So we're gonna show you examples of where Play Clean Go has been used in combination with um, other messaging and, and across um, a variety of outdoor recreation activities. Um, Krista, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Um, again, so here's just some of the examples of places where, or at recreation activities where Play Clean Go is applicable. Um, you know, you've got your hikers, your ATVers, bikers, dog walkers, um, anything touching the ground or even the water uh, has the potential to spread um, invasive species. And uh, the goal of, of the Play Clean Go outreach materials is that the, the visuals show the behavior and normalize what recreationists need to do. Um, and what really the vision that we have is similar to the vision that whoever designed the recycling symbol had and, that, and the, the sort of strategy behind recycling. And that is that when you see this very simple uh, triangle logo, you know exactly what you need to do. 
Well, our vision is that you all watching this webinar will take the Play Clean Go brand, put it on any recreation access point that you are involved with uh, providing outreach and prevention uh, tools and place that logo on that um, access point so that um, the place where the behavior change is desired, that access point, you know, people are seeing that consistent message. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Krista now, who's going to show you a little bit more about uh, the assets that Play Clean Go has and how you can grab, grab them. Krista? Thanks, Bill. So recreationists, however they enjoy the outdoors, inherently want to do the right thing to protect their favorite space. And what Play Clean, Play Clean Go does, it is informs these recreationists on how to do just that in a positive and easy way. So Play Clean Go provides the recreationists the opportunity to learn all of the simple steps they can take to help prevent the spread of invasive species. And here's some just really simple and great examples on prevention that these recreationists can do whether it's utilizing a boot brush station at a trailhead, having that handheld boot brush while they're on the trails, or uh, wiping down their uh, water equipment after they um, pull it from the water. More importantly though, Play Clean Go provides the tools to make it easier for the recreationists to implement prevention behaviors, such as the handheld boot brush that we saw in that earlier slide, um, as well as the communication tools for your organization to build on and share prevention messaging. Play Clean Go is available through many different channels to reach recreationists, which will also make it a lot easier for your organization to share with your particular user group. Play Clean Go also has uh, free graphics and printable handouts for your organization to use and add your logo to expanding on the consistent messaging that we like to see when it comes to prevention. And Play Clean Go is your one-stop shop to get the right prevention tools into the right hands, whether it's field workers or outdoor enthusiasts. Uh, one of the more exciting items that we've recently added to the store is a boot brush station kit. And in that image in the center that you see, our kits um, have the Brusher boot brush available at the base, and we'll also have the interpretive signage holder, and you can also include that interpretive sign as part of your um, order. So we make everything available for you to make it a lot easier to get that uh, prevention messaging out. One of the greatest indicators of Play Clean Go's reach are the 700 plus organizations across North America, including major federal land agencies like the National Park Service, use the Play Clean Go messaging in their outreach and educational efforts. And beyond the free graphics, uh, you can customize materials to your organization and or your species of concern. And there are two ways that you can personalize these items. Uh, you can join NASMA by going to nasma.org and you'll be provided access, among other things, to a huge graphic library and free graphic design time from NASMA's in-house graphic designer. Um, or for the more uh, budget-friendly, you can purchase the Play Clean Go Starter Kit, where you'll receive the Play Clean Go brand guidelines on how to utilize the logo and colors and different um, taglines. And you'll also be provided with five high-resolution logos of Play Clean Go. So if you have an in-house designer or you're um, design savvy yourself, you are able to um, personalize or customize the materials to your organization. Uh, one thing that is coming up in June that we are very, very excited for is Play Clean Go Awareness Week. Um, and what this does, it shows outdoor enthusiasts how they can stop invasive plants and pests from spreading while enjoying the great outdoors. And we invite you all to go to the playcleango.org uh, website or that link that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you can download all of the free different materials to help us get the message out of how simple prevention is. And we have in the kits um, graphics that are available for um, all the different social media platforms. 
We also have curated social media posts. We have uh, media releases that you can utilize, whether it's a national, local level. We have radio PSAs for you to download yourself, as well as um, informational videos that you can pull from the website and add them to your own or to uh, social media. So we really just want to make sure that we are enhancing the consistency and the simplicity of prevention. Um, and finally, we do want to say a huge thank you to our major contributors and partners, both financially or in kind, um, with their support that helped us spread the message across North America. And it's not just them. There will always be free resources available, but to support the expansion of research and new prevention tools, we definitely need your organization's help. So please go to playqueengo.org or go to nesma.org and take a look at all of the benefits of implementing Play Queen Go in your local organization. Excellent, thanks, Krista. Um, and I just wanted to add to that, since especially since Doug Jansen is still on, if he's still on the webinar, that um, this the Play Clean Go was developed by Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Uh, with major support from the U.S. Uh, Forest Service. Um, so huge shout out to Minnesota DNR for their efforts and um, very strategic vision in developing this brand. Um, and Doug Jensen, I know, was intimately involved with uh, the development of the campaign. Um, so with that, we're going to open it up for questions. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box um, in your control panel. Um, you can address a question to a specific one of the presenters uh, or, or everyone. So are there any questions? We've got up to 15 minutes left, if there are any questions. And I guess while people are thinking, um, I have a question for Tim. Um, Tim, maybe you can just reiterate how people can have access to the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers logo um, if they want to use it for their outreach assets. Yeah, so if you go to stopaquatichitchhikers.org, there I think is a menu across the top. There's a, a resources tab, and under that tab, there's just a web page with all of the different graphics that you can download. Uh, so they're right there. I downloaded uh, one today to put into my presentation. So it's pretty easy to access if you uh, need any of those. And they have uh, PDF, JPEG, all the really specific design files too. Perfect. Um, okay, here's a question for Lee. Um, in regards to moving firewood, is there a general rule of thumb for how far we can safely move firewood? For example, keep it to one city, county, etc. Yeah, so that's a really difficult question, even though it sounds deceptively simple. The research actually shows that the distance that would biologically make the most sense is 10 miles or less, but that is um, fairly unrealistic under most scenarios. And further, there are actually legal limits depending on geopolitical factors like the state boundaries or country boundaries. And so you could live one mile from a place where it'd be illegal. Um, the rule of thumb that we give out when all else fails is within 50 miles, but closer is always better. And um, if you live in the Eastern United States, especially, you can often buy certified heat treated firewood and certified heat treated firewood has been heat treated to the point where it's rendered um, functionally pest free. So you can move that firewood as far as you want. And it's almost always legal to move it as far, far as you want because it's certified as heat treated. Um, but it is, it's a weird question because, you know, distances that pests can move vary by the biology of the pest. And then also just, um, you know, realism kind of comes into play. You know, if you're going somewhere that it's going to be soaking wet, then you don't want to plan to gather firewood. You want to buy it ahead of time. And so then buying certified heat treated firewood and moving it hundreds of miles is really smart because it's pest free. Um, I can't see the Q&A for some funny reason. It must just be a setting. So if there's any other questions, let me know. Yeah, there aren't any yet coming in, uh, so we have some time yeah, uh, for folks to think of questions. Um, let's see. Let me, yep, let me just double check the chat box. I do not see you there. So we must have been really thorough in our presentations. Um, oh, wait, no, here's, here's come some. Okay, Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers shared post campaign surveys on behavior change from the public. Were there any done with the other campaigns? 
Um, good question. Um, shared post campaign surveys. Um, to my understanding, I don't think there has been a post uh, release survey from Play Clean Go. That's something that we're looking into doing very soon, in fact. Um, Lee, were there any? Yep. Yeah, we do have a number of surveys, and, and various um, partnering states have their own surveys as well. And what we see is that the consistent messaging makes a difference in the behavior of people and the intent of people. And um, like Tim said, with the example of eating fruit at snacks, sometimes your intent is actually pretty different from your behavior. Um, so we do like to see that both happen, that people say they won't move firewood and then campgrounds see that they're not moving firewood. Um, and that has been shown pretty um, consistently through the years. We've been doing surveys um, since I believe 2005 on this topic periodically according to funding availability. But what I will say that's a really, really important message is we see a pretty steep drop off when you let up on effort. So um, if, if there's a state or a region that is doing a pretty intensive amount of outreach, they get really good uptake of the message and really good behavior change. If you then survey them again a bunch of years later, and there simply hasn't been as much outreach, or maybe there just hasn't been funding for outreach, which is, you know, realistic, um, things go down again. Uh, so outreach is a really long haul. And I don't mean to be, you know, Debbie Downer on this, but we do see that that what people understand fades away in their memory. They think, oh, maybe it's not important. I haven't seen that message in a long time or whatever. Um, and so while we do see demonstrable improvement, we also see it fades over time. Great. Um, I have a couple of sort of back-to-back -back Play Clean Go questions. Uh, one, do you have examples of highly customized local campaigns used with Play Clean Go on the website? Um, asking from Hawaii. Um, Krista, help me out here. I don't think we have, we may have some examples of the co-branded outreach pieces on the website. I'm not sure. Um, I do know we have some in our library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have uh, one or two that you can view on our website at playcleango.org. Otherwise, you are correct if you want to see uh, how much more you can customize it. We have that available in our own graphic library, but I'd be happy to share. Great, thanks. Um, and then the back, the related, somewhat related question was, um, are there links to references for how effective boot brush stations are? In fact, yes, we have a blog from, um, uh, Chris Evans in, down in Illinois, uh, who did a, a study looking at the effectiveness of boot brush stations, and he wrote a blog, po blog post for us. Um, so, Krista, do we also have the link to that study on the website? Or on we do. Yeah, okay. Um, if you want to reach out to Krista directly uh, or myself, we can send you directly that link, but you should be able to find that on um, nasma.org. And let's see, a um, couple other questions here. How are people's involvement helpful in IAPS management? I'm not entirely sure what IAPS management is. Um, if you can clarify that, or if any of our presenters know what that reference is. Um, in the meantime, uh, someone is, says they work in wetlands. How would you recommend cleaning boots between sites, assuming boot brushing doesn't work well with wet boots? <laughs> So um, aside from using the boot brush stations, uh, your, your local state should probably have some form of decontamination for waders or um, um, your boots. And usually it's just like a, a bleach and water solution in between. Um, and just allow yourself at least five days to dry the boots or um, if you don't have that uh, bleach and water combination handy. Mm -hmm. But definitely check your local uh, decontamination guidelines. Yeah. Good one. Um, here's one, there's a question of, have there been problems with pest hitchhikers with camping equipment? Um, I, I just, I know anecdotally we've had, uh, we've had reports of that. I don't know if Lee or, um, I mean, yeah, Lee, I don't know if you have any studies looking at, um, at actual uh, studies looking at pest hitchhikers on camping equipment, but yeah. We do know that um, especially hard bodied stuff has a tendency to move um, things like gypsy moth, which has an external egg case that it places on things. So, for instance, 
when you look at the big sphere of camping equipment like RVs, which might include something like um, lawn furniture or uh, barbecue grills or um, the wheel wells of the RVs or of trailers, those types of hard services that are weather hardy, so you can leave them out for months on end, have a big role to play on the movement of pests um, on camping equipment. Softer things like a tent would be definitely a potential issue for weed seeds. Uh, so tents and tarps and um, fuzzy things like uh like the blankets that go underneath saddles of horses and mules those sorts of things are absolutely an issue for weed seeds that's more in the realm of the play clean go campaign than the don't move firewood campaign um when we talk about firewood as camping equipment we're getting into a place where the public wouldn't really understand it but we do know that hitchhikers in general attach themselves to a wide variety of camping type things great thanks lee uh, I think we might have time for a couple more questions. Here's one to any of our panelists. Um, how do you involve the local community in creating a message for preventing invasive species? Well, I can start with that one in that I, we always try to involve the local uh, folks that are the trainers for the community. So for instance, um, county educators, university staff, somebody who's really in the community and that's often how we figure out whether or not a particular message is going to fly with a particular area like a, a great example of that is um in new hampshire they have discovered and, and you know various people i work with in new hampshire nobody in new hampshire likes the message that you should buy firewood where you burn it because they don't want to be told what to do it's kind of, we've actually kind of been joking about it it's like live free or die and don't tell me how to buy firewood um and so in, in New Hampshire, you know, the those communications with all the different local state um, staff and the campground owners that the state staff talked to have informed our approach that we really go heavy on the gather firewood when appropriate message in New Hampshire because they they don't care for being told what to do. Interesting. Krista or Tim, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think just to build off that, I think having a good dialogue with your local partner is a great way to start just to figure out maybe what specific concerns that they might have and how to kind of fit their message underneath the larger branding and message of whatever uh, campaign you're working with. Then I think like what we like to do with our Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers materials, if possible, is just leave a little bit of room, especially on signage if we can, for the inclusion of some local materials or just try to think about, you know, if there isn't room, how can people still include that local message uh, that they think is really important to get out uh, with those materials. Great. Krista, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, what Tim said. <laughs> that was very clear and concise. When you have something that is um, is universal as these uh, branding campaigns are, it's, it's very simple to engage in that conversation um, early on with all of these different preserves or um, user groups or even municipal uh, leaders. Yep. All right. Um, Doug Jensen had a note here that the Great Lakes Sea Grant Network, led by Minnesota, pertaining to uh, one of our previous questions, um, conducted Habitattitude post-event evaluations at eight events um, before or after awareness increased from 71% to 90% um, and reported, reported behaviors increased before or after it to 75 to 89%. They went from 45 to, 80, 45 to 89%. So those are some great numbers there. Thanks, Doug. Um, let's see, we have time for one more question. Let's see. Um, uh, so there's a question here about educating landscape companies. That is really something, I, I mean, I'll say, I think that that's something that's outside the realm of what these campaigns are achieving to do. I mean, the audience of Play Clean Go don't move firewood, stop aquatic hitchhikers is really targeted at the recreationists. However, there are some good programs out there that are working to try to educate the landscape companies. Um, it's really, it really deserves its own webinar. <laughs> um, and in fact, later this week, Kurt uh, Dreiselker will kind of, he may touch on that. He's talked from the Morton Arboretum. He'll talk about um, how, uh, uh, sorry, uh, botanic gardens can be sentinels for invasive species. 
Lee, did you want to touch on that? Yeah, I think um, that that's exactly it is that um, every campaign needs to know what its best target audience is. And um, we get asked a lot about how landscaping campaigns that take down trees should uh, provide outreach about not moving the resulting bulk firewood that comes down when somebody takes a tree. And so we certainly have messages if somebody reaches out to us, but we also want to respect that in order to really reach the people we reach well, we can't be all things for all people. And so we rely a lot on our partnering campaigns to reflect those professional realm messages so that we can really stick to the ones that we do best. Um, so while those messages are incredibly important, they're not necessarily the focus that we carry. And I think, you know, when, when you mostly work with the recreational realm, it's hard to pivot to professional outreach. And so you want to make sure you work with the best local partners to do that so that you don't have to dilute yourself too thin. Yep, well said. Thanks, Lee. And with that, we are right up at the hour. So I want to thank our panelists again today uh, for uh, providing this fantastic content. I consider everyone in the panel partners um, with our campaign. We work together a lot, and we hope that you all watching today will join us as well, and you'll use the resources that our campaigns provide for you. Uh, this webinar was recorded and will be made available through NASMA's YouTube channel. Um, so if you have a colleague who didn't get a chance to join today, you're, uh, we encourage you to forward um, our YouTube channel to them. Uh, so with that, thank you all again, all of our attendees for joining us. And I hope you tune in for the rest of the week's webinars. And happy National Invasive Species Awareness Week. Have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.